Well, to talk about all these new developments in the Sri Lanka investigation, I'm joined by Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, former U.S. Ambassador to Morocco and former Deputy White House Senior Advisor, and also Gadi Adelman, a counterterrorism expert and advisor. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. A Ambassador Ginsburg, so many are scratching their heads over this after learning that two of the suicide bombers came from wealthy and politically connected families. Uh, does that strike you as unusual? Well, it does strike you, anyone, as unusual. After all, uh, the type of uh, person that fits the uh, persona of a suicide bomber is usually an unemployed youth who is not well-educated and has been more or less brainwashed by a radical Islamic theology. So, no, so absolutely, this is a very unusual situation. But I want to remind you that uh, as, as early as uh, eight months ago, there had been a rash of anti-Muslim attacks uh, in Sri Lanka, which had led to the deaths of, thou of hundreds uh, in Sri Lanka. I would like to know what is the religious indoctrination of these so-called middle-class youth. Yeah, interesting question for sure. Gadi, I'll bring you in now. Uh, from a counterterrorism perspective, does wealth and political connection go against the profile of a terrorist? No, I have to disagree with the ambassador on that. I apologize. But if you look back at history, you will find oftentimes many terrorists, including those that are suicide bombers, are extremely well educated, including up to not just master's degrees, but oftentimes PhDs. So although, yes, overall per capita, you're going to find them to be less educated, it is not uncommon to have them educated as well. Ambassador, authorities in Sri Lanka say one of the dead suicide bombers was the ringleader, the, the mastermind behind the attacks, and, and they're saying he radicalized the others. I mean, what does the, his death mean for maybe his surviving followers? Do they then carry on? Well, the particular organization that is allegedly responsible, a domesticated, violent, ridden Islamic organization, whose name would uh, probably be too long to pronounce on this show and keep you on the air, <laughs> uh, is, has some connections to the mainland in India, and perhaps even, although I am myself am not necessarily convinced, some loose affiliation to some ISIS cells, perhaps in Afghanistan or in Pakistan. So the trail is still, uh, unfortunately, too cold for me to make a determination. But most importantly, I need, it's important for us to understand that the convulsive nature of the Sri Lankan government, which is frankly a dislocated, dysfunctional regime, contributed to this because there clearly had been warning signs that a planned attack of this magnitude was in the works. Uh, Gadi, does the death of a terror ringleader help stop radicalization or, or, or can it make it worse? I wouldn't say either or. You know, anytime you have someone in that situation, in that position that passes away or is killed, someone always steps up to take his place. So I don't think that it's going to necessarily stop it. Um, on the make it worse, it's possible. There could be retaliation, but there doesn't need to be a reason for attacks. Retaliation may very well be a excuse or a reason that that particular organization gives, but it doesn't mean that terrorism wouldn't have occurred anyway. Uh, gentlemen, let's talk about the Sri Lankan government admitting they ignored multiple warnings that a terror attack is imminent. Uh, Ambassador, you alluded to this a moment ago. Officials say it was a major intelligence lapse and now heads could roll over this. I mean, the defense secretary, the inspector general uh, of police, are, both are on the chopping block. Ambassador, how does that kind of lapse happen? Well, because you have essentially a president and a prime minister in Sri Lanka who are adversaries of each other and that the, their respective allies do not talk to each other, do not communicate. There is bifurcation not only with, between the prime minister and the president, but also within the ministries, particularly the intelligence and defense ministries. And frankly, just watching the defense minister's performance in the wake of the attack on air uh, should have him on the chopping block no matter what. Uh, but, Gotti, I mean, this sounds like kindergarten. I mean, lives are at risk here. How can, you know, one hand not want to talk to the other hand about very important uh, tele mm -hmm. intelligence information when lives are at stake? No, the ambassador is absolutely correct. And, and I talked about this two nights ago on this show. 
about the falling out, the political falling out that occurred between the prime minister and the president in Sri Lanka. And I said, this is what happens when you put politics above the safety of your own country. And what we saw absolutely could have been prevented because one kept the other from seeing this material. I read the brief that came from India to Sri Lanka, and it had the names of the perpetrators. It had addresses of safe houses. This is why we saw within three hours of the bombings, the Sri Lankan authorities going to all these different places, and they've made over 40 arrests now. It's because they had it all, but didn't act on it in advance. But do you think that that inaction was deliberate? I mean, there are reports that this intelligence information was deliberately kept uh, from getting around to the top brass. You know, I, I would hate to think that it was deliberate, knowing what we now know and how high that this death toll has risen. And given what was in that briefing, I don't know what's going on in the minds of those over in Sri Lanka as far as the internal workings of the sure. politicians. But to think that this was deliberate, that's a frightening thought. And Ambassador, I mean, I'll ask you that same question, deliberate or, or no? I mean, something happened here. Well, it's, it was, in my judgment, given my understanding of the Sri Lankan government situation, uh, it was deliberate uh, in that they, there, was, there may have been some attempt here to embarrass one office over the other. Now, I, I agree with Gabby. I hate to see that this was something that, that would have been deliberate. But given the circumstances that we've seen so far, uh, it really is a calamity that the Sri Lankan government was given so much notice and was unable or unwilling to take responsibility to intersect and inter interdict the attacks. Well, gentlemen, stay with me. There, there's some other international news ahead on terrorism that I want to get your take on. Welcome back. The U.S. is stepping up the pressure on Hezbollah. The Treasury Department has imposed new sanctions against two people and three firms accused of helping the terror group evade American sanctions. One of those people is a financier based in Belgium who is the son of a top Hezbollah official. The move comes a few days after the State Department offered a reward of up to $10 million for information that could help disrupt Hezbollah's financing. The U.S. says Hezbollah's regional clout expanded as it sent fighters to Middle East conflicts, including the war in Syria, where it supported President Bashar al-Assad. Meantime, the children of a couple murdered in a terror attack in the West Bank are suing the governments of Syria and Iran, Item and Nama Henkin were shot and killed after their car was taken over by three Palestinian gunmen during a botched kidnapping attempt back in 2015. The couple's four children witnessed the murder of their parents from the back seat of their car. The lawsuit blames Syria and Iran for backing the militant group Hamas and the gunmen responsible for the attack. Well, for more on this, I'm joined again by Ambassador Mark Ginsburg, former U.S. Ambassador to Morocco and former Deputy White House Senior Advisor, and also Gadi Adelman, a counterterrorism expert and advisor. Gadi, I'll, I'll start with you this time. This lawsuit sounds like a new way to hold Syria and Iran accountable for supporting Hamas. Is, is that your take? I wouldn't say it's a new way. Um, the justice for the United States Victims of State-Sponsored Terrorism Act was done in 2015. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's new a new way, but it, it now allows, you know, the U.S. justice system now allows recourse for victims. And these procedures that are in place are designed specifically to pursue justice on behalf of American victims of international terrorism. The question is, how far will this lawsuit get? Whether or not there's going to be anything that Syria or Iran when they're held responsible in a court in the United States, you know, what is the family going to see in the end? Or is it going to be another situation where then the Justice Department has to go after funds that are locked down uh, here in the United States that belong to those two countries? Yeah, those are interesting questions. Ambassador, I'll ask you, I mean, can Iran and Syria be held responsible for every killing at the hands of Hamas? And then, as Gadi says, will anyone ever see any money from it? Well, in answer to, I agree with Gotti, I think he's absolutely right on this. The, the jurisdictional issues here raise important questions, number one. Number two, the fact is, is that I have yet to see any real effective result occur as a result of these lawsuits. 
that particularly against Iran and, and uh, Hezbollah, the fact is, is that you're, they're suing Hamas and drawing a, a line of responsibility between Hamas, Hezbollah, and, and Iran is one thing. Then collecting would be an entirely different matter, whether or not even there's enough sufficient jurisdiction and nexus with the, the legal term here to be able to, in effect, claim certain amount of financial reward as a result remains to be seen. So, so then, Gotti, I mean, what's the point here of suing the gunman responsible for the attack? I mean, that seems like a stretch. They're in prison, so there's no real benefit to the lawsuit other than maybe publicity. Well, publicity is a big one, and, and I'm certainly not going to argue with the ambassador on this one. He's far more knowledgeable on the international ramifications than I am. But if, if it can be drawn in a court of law to show the ties between the funds that Hamas receives from Iran, that's just another feather in the cap on the war on terrorism. So again, yes, there is the public or publicity asset there, but I, I do not think and I have yet to see any monetary awards that have gone forward after this. Well, according to the lawsuit, Hamas relies heavily on Iran and Syria for material support, including training, weapons and financing. Ambassador, do you think this kind of lawsuit can be a deterrent to stop that kind of support? No, uh, flatly no. Hmm. Uh, I, I agree with Gotti that the publicity factor may be important for the family, but uh, there's no amount of lawsuits that's going to deter uh, these terrorist states and terrorist organizations from continuing to support Hamas. I mean, that's the diabolical aspect of what has transformed in Gaza over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, we have seen Hamas, which had been supported as a standalone Muslim Brotherhood, radical Shia, uh, Sunni organization, all of a sudden become a, a, friend of, a friend of the family, so to speak, of Iran, Shiite terrorist Iran, which more or less shows that when it comes to Israel and supporting terrorist proxies, Iran is not going to let religion get in the way. And, and Gadi, I mean, I mean, the ambassador is right. I mean, support for Hamas is strategic, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, he's he's 100 percent right. I have, I have nothing to add to that. He's 100 percent on the money. All right. Well, you know, gentlemen, there's another story uh, that I want to get you to discuss. Iran is again threatening to retaliate against the U.S. over its decision to stop issuing any more waivers for countries who sought to get around U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, called the end of the oil waivers a hostile measure and said that it won't be left without a response. Iran's foreign minister also warned of consequences. Listen. President Trump's aim is to bring us to our knees to talk. B team wants regime change at the very least. They so, want disintegration of Iran as their objective. It's not a crisis yet, but it's a dangerous situation. Accidents, plotted accidents, are possible. I wouldn't discount the B team plotting an accident, anywhere in the region, particularly as we get closer to the election here. So dangers are there. We're not there yet. So Ambassador Ginsburg and Gadi Alleman, let's talk about this. Iran is clearly not happy about the U.S. stopping waivers from sanctions against countries that are importing Iranian oil. But Ambassador, the promise of some kind of response from Iran sounds like a threat. Well, you've had uh, Rouhani come out and uh, urge the president of the United States to apologize for the sanctions and then to get back to the negotiating table, uh, which, of course, is unlikely. And secondly, the fact is, is that while these sanctions are, are these, these waivers are going to be taken away from China and India, uh, I think also Iraq, the real problem is going to be with Iraq. And I, I want to focus on Iraq for a second. Iraq is dependent on the import of, importation of Iranian oil to be able to f fuel its, uh, its electrical turbines. Uh, no power in, in Iraq causes problems for a government that we're trying to support let alone worrying about the price of oil that's shooting through the roof as a result of taking Iranian oil off the table. So, look, this is a double-edged sword with one final comment on this. 
Uh, the Iranians once again have threatened to interfere with shipping through the Straits of Hormuz as a result in the Trump administration retorted by issuing a warning that the United States will not accept any interference with the supply and egress and entrance of oil tankers through the Straits. Uh, Gadi, I mean, I'll bring you in. Isn't a response from Iran expected here? I mean, ending waivers from sanctions on countries doing business with Iran wasn't exactly under the radar. Well, you know, it's, this is not the first time, nor will it be the last, that yeah. we see Iran threatening the United States. And each time they do it, you know, I say it all the time, they refer to the United States as the big Satan and Israel as the little Satan. This new move is going to impact possibly several different countries that purchase oil from Iran, and that would be Japan, South Korea, Turkey, India, and China. But two of those countries who are the biggest purchasers are India and China, who may just say, well, you know what, the United States, to heck with your ideas, and we're going to do what we want. We're going to keep buying it. So I don't think we're going to see that much happening as far as that is concerned. But what concerns me is the Strait of Hormuz. Sure, sure. Well, a Ambassador, there's, there's also great concern in the U.S. Or, and around the world that this back and forth between the U.S. and Iran over sanctions and waivers will spike oil prices right through summer. Uh, does that concern ratchet up the pressure here, you think? Well, sure it does. I mean, the American taxpayer is going to go and fill up their gasoline tank and see that the price of gasoline is shooting up and up. And in May, it's now past $3.30 in some states for, for a regular gallon of, of uh, gasoline. And the fact is, is that those who trade in this commodity uh, are very interested in seeing the price of oil go up, including many of the members of OPEC. So while Saudi Arabia and, uh, and the United Arab Emirates have promised to, in effect, increase production. It remains to be seen whether that will be enough to have, shall we say, to let the Trump administration have its cake and eat it with respect to the domestic consequences and the international results. Sure. And, and Gotti, I mean, isn't this all about oil at the end of the day? I mean, Iran's oil reserves arguably are at the root of its conflicts in the Middle East. Well, it's, it's about oil at the end of the day in the sense that the, the sanctions on Iran have not taken hold to the point that the administration would like to see it. It has not yet had that effect. Part of it goes back to Hezbollah and the billion dollar plus per year drug smuggling and criminal enterprise that they have throughout the world that sure. funds the state sponsor of terrorism. But I think, you know, like the Mark, or pardon me, the ambassador just mentioned, <laughs> That's right, uh, sir. You have Saudi Arabia who has pledged to make up the difference. So I don't know, that, and hopefully, and, and I, I could be wrong, but hopefully I'm not, I don't know that we'll see an impact at the pump, per se, if Saudi Arabia picks up the slack. I mean, no one wants Can to I see an impact. Can I just add one quick sure, comment? Sure, go ahead. Can I, just a quick comment. You know, while we're doing this against Iran, you know we've also taken, as best as we can, Venezuelan oil off the market. So this is a double whammy in the global oil market right now that the Trump administration is having to navigate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, Ambassador yes. Mark Ginsburg, Gotti Adelman, thank you for your time doing double duty on a number of topics for us. We appreciate it here on Clear Cut.